All right, so triangles, uh, they are a corrective pattern. They're one of the core Elliott wave patterns of which there are five. Um, now triangles seem to reflect a balance of forces. They typically manifest themselves as a sideways price structure. Uh, they contain five overlapping waves labeled A, B, C, D, and E, and they are drawn using two trend lines. So we have the AC trend line and the BD trend line. So that part should be fairly straightforward, but again, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in there. We've got three varieties. We have the contracting triangle, barrier triangles, and expanding triangles. Uh, we're gonna go over the different variations, but my first note here is that expanding triangles are exceedingly rare. So if you find yourself labeling uh, a triangle as an expanded triangle, I would urge you to go back to that count, find a different way of labeling that pattern, um, but keep, you know, Keep the expanded triangle in your back pocket, but they are so rare that I would never um, have that as you know my primary alternative or, or maybe even my second backup alternative count. All right, so they, they are truly, truly rare. Now, a running triangle occurs when wave B makes a new price extreme relative to wave A. Uh, so in both these idealized line diagrams, we have examples of triangles of the running variety. So in this, uh, bullish in this triangle in a bullish trend. Notice how wave B makes a new price extreme above this wave here. Okay, so that's where triangles trip up a lot of people. So I, I find a lot of people that say they're using Elliott uh, ignore the running triangle because they, well, they, I, I guess they haven't read through all the rules and guidelines. And here we have a bearish impulsive wave followed by a bearish running triangle. Again, wave B is making a new price extreme relative to the end of this prior bearish impulse. So the final important note about triangles is that they always occur in a position prior to the final actionary wave in the pattern of one larger degree. This is an extremely important point because it tells us specifically where triangles can and cannot take shape. So if you think you're tracking an unfolding impulse wave, one, two, three, four, five, and you spot a triangle in wave two, then you've, your count is either wrong or there is a triangle in that second wave, but it's not the entirety of the correction. Let's say it's a B wave triangle, okay? But if you're convinced that it is in fact a triangle, then you have to abandon that one, two, three, four, five impulsive count and shift to a corrective count. All right, so I hope that makes sense. Again, if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, all right, just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything new in the chat. Okay, so here are some examples of the different variations of triangles. We've got contracting triangles, barrier triangles, and expanding triangles. All right, so um, in the barrier variation, it's worth noting that you will only get an ascending barrier triangle in an uptrend. What is an ascending barrier triangle? It's where the BD trend line is more or less uh, flat, so has no slope, zero degree angle, while the AC trend line is sloping upwards. Uh, in a bear market, it's the opposite. You're going to get a descending barrier triangle only in a bear market. Okay, so again, the BD trend line is flat and the AC trend line is sloping lower. Now with the expanding triangle, the important point to note here is that wave B is making a new price extreme, wave C makes a new price extreme below wave A, wave D makes a new price extreme above wave B, and wave E makes a new price extreme below wave C, and you would just flip this for a bearish expanding triangle. Again, exceedingly rare. So the quick, quick notes on the contracting triangle, um, this actually applies to all triangles. A triangle will always subdivide into five waves. That part is universally applicable. Um, now, when I say five waves, all right, each of the subwaves in the triangle must be a zigzag or a variation thereof, and that's just a fancy way of saying uh, a double zigzag, okay? Now, sometimes wave E will subdivide itself into a triangle. Again, this is quite rare. It doesn't happen all the time. There's one example off the top of my head that's fairly recent that we can take a look at in Euro dollar, um, but by and large, the subwaves will be zigzags. So if you're counting one of the subwaves of the triangle as a flat, you've done something wrong. Yeah, either you've counted the subwave incorrectly or you're actually not dealing with a triangle. Okay, 
So wave C in a contracting triangle never moves beyond the end of wave A, wave D never moves beyond the end of wave B, and wave E never moves beyond the end of wave C, right? So that's how we get that converge, those converging trend lines and how the triangle gets its name, contracting triangle. Uh, now a contracting triangle never has more than one complex subwave, in which case it is always a zigzag combination, so a double zigzag or a triangle. Uh, so running triangles, like we covered before, they're quite frequent. They occur approximately 40% of the time. Uh, now that statement was made, I believe, in the late 80s, uh, early 90s by Robert Prechter. And while there hasn't been enough research done on this since, I would actually just anecdotally place the occurrence of running triangles closer to 50%. So they are quite common. Barrier and expanding triangles, they have the same characteristics as a contracting triangle for the most part, except that waves B and D are essentially at the same level. Now, they don't have to be the same level, like to the tick. You know, there, there can be an allowance, all right? But if there is what, and I'm using air quotes here, if there is a significant variance between waves D and E, then you might want to consider if there is an alternative count that you can uh, switch to. Now, for expanding triangles, Wave C, D, and E, like I said, each of those subwaves moves beyond the end of the preceding same directional subwave. Uh, so the result is that going forwards in time, the trend lines diverge instead of converging like they would in a contracting triangle. Okay, so again, we've got some examples here, uh, some real world examples. So we had this barrier triangle in dollar ruble. Again, notice all the subwaves are either zigzags or variations thereof. Um, this is what happens with triangles. They occur in the penultimate sequence, right? So in this case, we have a fourth wave triangle. Wave five is the ultimate sequence. The triangle is the penultimate sequence. And typically what you can expect once we get a thrust out of that triangle is a very, very strong, very sharp movement um, all the way out. I'm just gonna make sure there's no one waiting to get in. Okay, good. All right, so moving on to this dollar yen triangle, uh, which was really the story of, of this currency pair over the last two years. Uh, so again, we have another converging triangle here. Uh, here we have a triangle in Solana, again, converging triangle. Again, notice the subwaves, all zigzags or variations thereof. Uh, Southwest Airlines, great example of a running triangle. My good friend Jeffrey Kennedy over at Elliott Wave International provided me with this specific example uh, when I was asking him if he had any textbook running triangles off the top of his head. Uh, so that's it on triangles. Again, I, I'm moving through that piece fairly quickly because it is really the, you know, the table stakes <laughs> for our premium clients. You know, to be on these webinars, you've got to know the basics of these patterns. Uh, so again, because we've opened this one up, if you do have questions about the triangle pattern in general, just let me know. So we're now gonna take a look at a triangle that's recently completed, and a few of you have pointed this triangle out, and it was a good trade. Robert knows because uh, he saw me put this trade on and saw me manage it from start to end as well. Uh, so it was this triangle in Swiss Yen, all right? Uh, it was a fourth wave triangle. So again, let's go over our rules. What are the rules for a triangle? Well, uh, they can't take place in wave two if we're tracking an impulsive sequence. So as a corrective pattern it has to take place in the wave Y position, all right? Uh, this is a contracting triangle, okay? Tri triangle of the contracting variety. Uh, again, notice all the subwaves A, B, C, D, and E are either zigzags or variations thereof. There are no flats here. Um, and yeah, in this case, wave E is also a zigzag, small zigzag, not a triangle, okay? Now, for wave E, you'll notice that the B wave of wave E, right, because we have an ABC zigzag for wave E, the wave B was a flat. So, of course, in a zigzag, wave B can take on any corrective pattern, right? So it could be a triangle, could be a flat, um, but the end result is that the entirety of the subwave is a zigzag. Okay, so we've identified the triangle. Um, that's great. This one's very straightforward. It was a very clean uh, triangle, quite textbook. Okay, so now we're going to move towards the next really important question, which is how do we trade it? All right, so at Parallax, 
and I've made videos on this in the past, we have a four step trading process. All right, so step number one is trend identification. Step number two is market structure analysis. Uh, step number three is momentum analysis. And then step number four is what we call test, which is time frame, entry, stop loss, and target. Okay, so trend, well, we've already established that it was bullish because we have that one, two, three, wave four um, unfolding five wave impulse, right? Market structure analysis, that's where I want to identify what is the core Elliott wave pattern that we're looking at here. We've established that it is a triangle momentum. Now you can analyze momentum in a variety of ways. I personally like looking at the RSI and the MACD. Now this isn't a class on momentum, so I'm going to move right through this, but if you do have a question on this topic, let me know. So one of the things I'm looking at, especially in the MACD histogram here, is how we have this general bullish divergence in the MACD histogram as the, as the triangle is coming to uh, its conclusion. So that gives me a sense that there is hidden underlying buying pressure within this market. The other thing I'm looking at with the RSI is can we break above 50? So this middle dash line there is the 50 reading in the RSI indicator. I want to make sure that we're trading above that 50 line. Uh, so 50 kind of represents neutral momentum. So oftentimes you'll hear me talk about bull market, uh, resist, uh, bull market support and bear market resistance with the RSI indicator. Because we're in an uptrend, I'm looking for bull market support near the conclusion of this pattern. Bull market support is typically between 50 and I'll say roughly just above um, the, the uh, oversold point of 30. So I'd say 50 to about 30 or so is where I'm looking for bull market support. Uh, the reason it's a rough range is because I'm also going to look at where the RSI has found support in the past. So we can see here, there's a swing point in the RSI. So that's support. So I'm looking at the range here. I'm looking at this formation. If I really wanted to go nuts, I can even draw trend lines here on the RSI and say, all right, we're, looks like we're breaking out of this little descending wedge. I don't go that far. I'm simply looking at is momentum trending upwards, which is what I would want to see with a bullish trend continuation pattern. And then finally, we're getting to the good, good stuff, which is test, time frame, entry, stop loss, and target. Okay, so time frame. This is how I assess time frame, and it's fairly straightforward. I'm not talking about whether you should take the trade on an hourly chart or a four hour chart. I'm saying I want to be looking at the relationships in time between the corrective sequences. So if I'm looking at this running flat here in wave two, and it took basically a day, a day for wave two to complete. Um, let's see if is there proportionality then in terms of the triangle completing six days. All right, well, triangles are sideways price patterns and they do take a long time to complete. Okay, so I can say, all right, I just wanted to make sure that my triangle is not unfolding or not completing uh, in, in a time duration that's less than one day. The next thing I'm gonna look at is how long did wave one take to complete? So wave one took about a day. Let's see how long did wave three complete? Wave three completed over five days. All right, so, you know, wave three seems like my extended wave here. Um, so if I had to guess, I would say that wave five was going to unfold in a manner that's fairly similar to wave one. All right. So I'm looking for a uh, time frame horizon to be in this trade for about one to two days, I would say. Right. So time frame one to two days. That's how long I plan on being in this trade. Uh, my entry point. Well, I gave this away on the YouTube video and it's not, it's definitely not unique to me. Um, but one, my favorite way of trading a triangle, the triangle pattern directly is to enter on a break of the extreme of wave D, which in the case of the Swiss yen triangle came in at 141.82. I'm then looking to place a stop just beyond the extreme of wave E. So we're looking at a stop around 141.14. Um, and then finally the target. So there are many ways we can derive targets for a triangle. One method is the post triangle thrust measurement. So to do this, I simply just extend the BD trend line. Uh, technically, you can also extend the AC trend line if you want, but uh, I, I find just for the sake of efficiency, extending the BD trend line is fine. I then look at where the triangle um, starts, really, so the end of wave A here, I'm just taking a 90 degree line 
to the top of that trend line. I then take a mirror image of this line and I place it at the end of wave E. And that's my post triangle thrust measurement. So again, I'm looking at 190 pip move, uh, which carries us to just above the 143 handle. Now you can see how well the triangle thrust measurement worked in this particular case, but I don't wanna rely on just one target measurement. I wanna be looking at a few other things. So one other thing I'll be looking at is the Fibonacci relationships between waves one and five. Why is that? It's because within a full Elliott wave cycle, waves one, two, three, four, five, we will have at least one extended wave. Usually that wave is wave three. So if wave three is the extended wave, then waves five and waves one will tend towards equality or a Fibonacci relationship thereof. So we can see that the equality measurement is a little bit higher up there, okay, around 143.67. Um, but that's not all, we're not done yet. We're, all, we're gonna take a look at one more Fibonacci relationship, which is the length traveled from waves one through three and then measuring that from the end of wave four. Now this looks complicated. I'm not gonna say it's easy, um, but it is a fairly simple concept to understand. And like anything else, it just requires practice and repetition before it becomes sec second nature. So now I've got another Fibonacci relationship. Um, now people tend to use Fibonacci. I won't say they use it incorrectly, but I think they use it in a manner that's too simple. They usually just look at retracement levels or relationships over one wave and then measure extensions off of that one wave. That's not a bad method, but I've found, and so has, uh, you know, so has Robert Prechter, AJ Frost, Hamilton Bolton, and, and Ralph Nelson Elliott himself, they found that the Fibonacci relationships between waves seem to be much more significant. So in any case, what I'm looking for are overlaps. I'm looking for areas where I have what are called Fibonacci clusters. So there's a cluster right here. We can see that between 143.08 and 143.18, that is where um, wave five would be at 38.2% times the length traveled from waves one through three. Um, and also we're at 76.4% times the length of wave one. So that falls quite short, you know, of my ideal minimum target uh, based on the Fibonacci relationships where wave five and one would be equal. That would be 143.67. And look, lo and behold, we have another Fibonacci cluster here. So that would be where wave five is equal to 50% uh, plus times the distance traveled from waves one through three. So we have another extension relationship there. So what do we do with all this information? Well, what, what this tells me is that I'm, I need to be paying very close attention to the area right around 143 because I've got two Fibonacci clusters that take place at that location and I have the triangle, the post uh, thrust triangle measurement that also comes in at that level, all right? So I would say that's my minimum target. That's what I would expect the market to be able to achieve um, and anything beyond that is a bonus. Well, <laughs> Here, the market gave us uh, the bare minimum and it looks like we've topped out in wave five. But uh, this was a great real-time example you know, of a triangle and how, uh, how that triangle was traded. Okay, so uh, I don't see any questions yet, so I'm just gonna keep going and we're gonna start focusing on some real world examples that I'm seeing right now. Uh, and they're all in the FX market. Okay, so right now I'm tracking what I believe is a larger B wave triangle um, that's you know wave B of wave C of a higher degree wave Y, uh, which is a complex correction in the Aussie dollar currency pair. Okay, so you can see I've already labeled the sub waves. So wave A is a zigzag, wave B is a zigzag, wave C is a zigzag, wave D is a zigzag, and wave E, which may have topped today, is also a zigzag. I would personally like to see wave E go a little bit higher, closer towards the wave B extreme, but that's the academic, Elliott wave academic in me that, you know, just is always looking for harmony and perfection. Of course, real world markets are not always harmonious and perfect. They are messy indeed. Uh, so anyway, wave E very well might have finished today, um, in which case we have our parameters, right? This would be wave D. This would be wave E. And uh, 
once you have your entry and your stop, you can start calculating the post triangle thrust measurement. You can start looking at all these other Fibonacci relationships as well. Now, one important thing to note is that there is an alternative count to this. So if we go over to a blank Aussie dollar chart, uh, it's possible that we have an ending diagonal for wave C. So this could be, this would be wave A of Y, this would be B of Y, and then this would be wave one of C of Y, two, three, four, then five. So there is also an ending diagonal uh, potential here, but I really like the way that this triangle is counting out so far. Um, and I see a number of potential triangles across the majors. So there is something there that tells me, all right, if the dollar is approaching an important fourth wave juncture here, um, then it makes sense that we would see a similar pattern in many of those dollar currency pairs. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next triangle that seems to be completing, which is in Dollar Canada. Okay, so we have, you know, Dollar CAD's been a very interesting currency pair because it's traded higher, yes, but all in, in a very corrective manner. So we have rising bottoms, you know, just technical analysis 101 here, but look at the slope of the move. The slope of the move is not very sharp. So this is a, ultimately a counter trend uh, advance. As a Canadian, that makes me very sad. I always enjoy it when we have a weak uh, Canadian dollar. Anyway, uh, so here we've got waves A, B, C, D, and like with the Aussie dollar, it's very possible that this triangle has completed uh, today. Right? So how do we know for sure? Well, that's where we start establishing our criteria. You know, have we followed the rules and guidelines of the pattern? Well, each of the subwaves is a zigzag. Uh, we're meeting reasonably good Fibonacci relationships for all of these. So obviously wave B is a running triangle. And in this case, uh, let's look at Fibonacci relationships between A and B. So wave B is 123.6% times the length of wave A. I like that Fib relationship quite a bit in running triangles. Wave C uh, was just exceeded the 61.8% retracement. So golden ratio right there. Wave D, 61.8% retracement. And wave E got pretty close. I think that looks like a 50% retracement. Yeah, almost 50% on the dot. Uh, so I like the Fibonacci relationships here. Um, you know, would I prefer to see another poke lower uh, to satisfy the 618? Um, I don't think it's necessary, frankly. This this is looking pretty good. Now I'm gonna offer you a couple hacks in terms of how to trade a triangle if you're not entirely sure that the triangle has completed quite yet. One thing you can always do if you want to take that entry on the break of wave D uh, is instead of placing your stop at the wave E extreme, you can place it at the wave C extreme. That will compromise the profit factor on this particular trade, but on the flip side, it will give you a little bit more protection and increase the chances you know, that you're gonna stay in the trade. So why would you place your stop at the wave C extreme? Well, the reason for that is actually quite straightforward. If this is wave A, B, C, and wave D is not done, then wave E might take out this low here, but it cannot take out the wave C low. So if you're very confident you are still dealing with a triangle, you're just not quite sure of the position of the subwaves, that's one hack that you can use, all right, is to widen the stop. We're still placing a stop loss uh, based on Elliott's rules and guidelines. We're just adjusting, right? We're just taking um, a little more risk in terms of how many, how many ticks we're, we're placing our stop beyond the wave E extreme point, but we are in a sense increasing the probability of us being right on the trade. So that's gonna come down to individual skill, preference, and risk tolerance. Uh, the final point is that, and I wouldn't do this in a running triangle, uh, so we can go back to perhaps another example, but if you're unsure, let's go back to the Swiss yen example. That was a good triangle in which we can illustrate an alternative entry point. So here's an alternative entry point. We've covered an alternative stop. Here's an alternative entry point. Again, if you're unsure that the triangle is complete, instead of using the wave D extreme, you can use the wave B extreme, okay? If you want it to be ultra conservative, you would use the wave three extreme, which I don't think is necessary. If you're really 
unclear or hazy about where the triangle has ended, you can always enter on a break of wave B and then place your stop at the wave E extreme. All right, so totally depends on your personality as a trader, which method you wanna use. So by and large, I mean, triangles are a very straightforward pattern to trade. Um, I, I would say they're not as straightforward to label. Trap I see many traders fall into is that they label the triangle far too, as complete far too early. Um, Aussie ends a great example of a triangle. And, and I, I'll give you another example of a triangle we traded recently in Euro Canada and Sterling Aussie actually. But uh, it's very tempting, I would say, to label this triangle as complete and say, hey, we have A, B, and C, that's wave D, and then we have what in Elliott we'd call a truncated wave E, which is a very short wave E, which is possible. Now this looks good because, you know, we get many touches off that trend line, uh, but, you know, that, that, we're on a daily time frame chart here, and, uh, this zigzag looks very clear on the daily chart. This zigzag looks really clear. This zigzag looks really clear. So this zigzag for wave D looks really clear. And then for wave E, we just get a straight line. I'm just not sure that that's, you know, that, that just doesn't fit the character of the rest of this triangle. Is it possible? Sure. But I think it's potentially a trap to label the triangle as being complete. So that's why I'm shifting um, my labels here slightly to accommodate a still unfolding wave D. And wave D can continue to unfold. It's, it's very possible that we get a barrier triangle, all right? So I don't think this triangle is complete as of yet. Uh, so I'm waiting, just I'm happy to wait and see how the market is going to unfold. I would rather miss a trade than rush into one, okay? I would rather miss an excellent trade than rush into one because your trading is not going to be defined by how many amazing trades you took. Ultimately, at the end of the year, it's going to be defined by how many crappy trades you didn't get into, okay? I have a very, very, very high win rate um, in both at relative and absolute terms in trading, right? It's been 100% over the last few months. Um, and if I look out over the year, it's well into the 80% range, right? So my win rate is very high. I don't take a ton of trades. I average maybe one to one and a half trades a week, okay? But the reason my win rate's high is because I have no problem letting trades go without me on board. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't bother me one bit, all right? So that's a very valuable trading lesson right here. Your trading is going to be defined by the trades you chose not to take, okay? I can't tell you how many times I've hit a few good trades in a row. I'm feeling hot. I'm on a good streak. I rush into the next trade because I'm like, ah, you know, I've, I'm, I can sacrifice a bit of profit here. And three or four trades later, I'm on a losing streak and I've given back all the gains. And I guarantee that that experience is not unique to me. All right. So that's a valuable risk management um, and opportunity selection lesson here. Okay. So we're just going to go over those past two triangles um, that we've traded recently. So one was in Sterling Aussie, right? So a, B, C, D, and E. Um, zigzags are almost never truncated. So although it's tempting to put the wave C label here, I, I yeah, you know, I, I actually, this triangle is a little bit messy. I, I think maybe the truncated interpretation is best. I haven't dug deep into the weeds on this one. So whether you want to place your uh, C label here or here, I, somewhat academic, it's still a triangle uh, and we've broken down. Um, so this one, again, pretty clear, pretty clear. If you see a sideways movement on a price chart and you're not quite sure what to make of it, odds are you're dealing with a triangle of some sort. Okay, next triangle was in Euro Canada. Again, this one, very, very clear indeed. Okay, A, B, C, D, and E. So very clear subwaves in this triangle and it's breaking down beautifully. So the final triangle we're gonna be taking a look at uh, is this really fascinating triangle in Euro dollar 
that concluded on July 22nd. Notice I have my wave four label here. Well, why do I have it here? It's because wave E of the triangle was also a triangle. So this is one of the most rare circumstances. So here we have wave A of the triangle, wave B, wave C, wave D, and then wave E. And we're gonna zoom right in here and take a look So wave D, uh, sorry, wave E of this triangle was also a triangle. So this is wave A, B, C, D, and E. How cool is that? So why is this triangle so cool? It's because what's the guidance for you know, for, for trading the triangle? Well, normally it would be entering on the break of the wave D extreme. But when you have wave E as a triangle, you can use the target from that higher time frame triangle while uh, utilizing the entry and stop guidance on the lower time frame triangle. So here you could get away with an entry just below wave D with a stop right above wave E. And I'll show you guys my trading results on this trade, but it was a really good risk reward ratio. Um, and you could use, like I said, the higher time frame target all the way down. So I'm not saying I got out at the very low, but that's you know one way that you get these very, very high quality profit factor trades from time to time. Uh, question, green, okay, perfect. All right, so that concludes what I've got to show on triangles. I hope it was pretty straightforward. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Would you like me to cover something else? Hey, Emery, this is Carrie. I have a question. Yeah. So how much do you focus on the price action after the conclusion of wave E um, when you are waiting for a break of the triangle to take a trade. So say you think wave E is complete and it meets all of the guidelines and the pattern looks clear. And the price action um, coming out of wave E, which would really be wave one of, of the, the, the next sequence, um, is it looks choppy and kind of corrective. Do you look at that or do you just um, look at the break of the triangle structure? Well, so I don't care of the price action coming out of wave E. Um, I mean, I care, but I'll, I'll show, I'll use the Swiss yen triangle as a great example here. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, we have our impulse, right? Uh, so I, I don't really, you know, when I was looking at this, I wasn't on a five or 15 minute chart counting the subwaves. I'm keeping things fairly simple and saying, all right, I believe I've got the triangle here. I'm entering on the break of wave D, placing my stop at the wavy extreme. Um, now what you can do is, yeah, let's see if we get into a, a five wave impulse in wave one of five. But sometimes the thrust out of the triangle is very swift and you're not gonna see those crystal clear subdivisions. What threw me off a little bit was this pretty complex wave two. So we had a very complex wave two, and I didn't expect to see a complex wave two because if a triangle is thrusting out, then I expect the resolution to be fairly quick. And like I said at the beginning, my time frame on this trade was to be in it for about a day, and it took yet yeah, two days, two days to to resolve. So the complex wave two threw me off a bit, um, but that wasn't a reason for me to abandon my trade. Why? Because I have to be bullish against the wavy extreme, especially that I can count five waves. But if we look at the Euro CAD uh, triangle, which is, I, I know that's one that we've traded together, you know, we have something here with a lot of overlaps. Okay, so that's not like the most ringing endorsement of an unfolding bearish wave unless you adopt a super bearish count uh, where you have a series of nested one, two, one, twos. But the subwaves look clear to me, uh, the triangle looked mature, so I have confidence taking that entry and waiting for more market price action to unfold in order to determine whether or not I have to adjust my bias. And it was a very similar thing with Sterling Oz. Uh, so here, you know, this is this, where I'm, where that red line is, is the end of wave E. Uh, and this is ostensibly wave one. You know, again, this doesn't count like a crystal clear 
impulse wave to me, although it obviously is based on the slope and the size of the decline and the fact that we're making new lows. Uh, but again, I'm not necessarily paying such close attention to that. I'm focused more on whether or not we're exceeding or breaking the key levels from which I would expect the ensuing impulse to, uh, to, to unfold. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, you know, if, if you do have the opportunity to see those crystal clear sub waves, that's just, that's fantastic. Uh, but it's not a necessary prerequisite. Wave ones do tend to be quite messy to begin with. Uh, now, Robert had a question about, you know, do I pay attention to time between subwaves? I personally don't. I won't look into the subwaves in the triangle, but I'm going to look at the time the triangle is taking to unfold relative to other corrections. Um, so if I'm looking at this wave B here, uh, then, you know, how long, I mean, this triangle started to unfold since May. So that's, that's that's a long time, you know. That that's a long time for for a triangle to be unfolding, right? We're looking at you know 104 days or so, uh, and then I'm going to look at you know what's an equivalent corrective sequence. Well, here you know this wave X was even longer, 225 days. But we're in the ballpark in terms of those corrections being roughly proportionate in size. If wave X uh, took you know let's say four months to complete, and then this triangle I could count it complete in two weeks. Yeah, that tells me that there's probably something wrong there. I probably am not dealing with a triangle after all. But time is the most trickiest element. Uh, time is by far the most trickiest element to forecast. Would I look to trade a reversal after the triangle target has been met? Yeah, okay, so let's talk about that. <laughs> uh, it, it's definitely possible, okay? It's definitely possible, but you, you have to always understand degrees of trend, all right? So if in Swiss yen, all right, I'm looking at this on a one hour chart, all right? It's a one hour chart. So does that mean that I think the reversal is gonna be worth trading? No, because I, th I think this is five waves up to combine uh, for a larger wave one. We're going to get a larger wave two and then we're gonna go for wave three. So I don't really care too much to trade for the reversal. I'm primarily a trend trader. I'm not even interested in trading for wave C. I'd rather wait for the entire ABC to finish before we go higher. Uh, dollar yen, however, very different. Look at the size of this triangle. You know, we started this corrective sequence in January of 2012. Um, once this triangle concludes, you know, this is a B wave triangle, I mean, right, for wave C. Once this wave C concludes, yes, I will look to trade the reversal because there is a lot to play for. So whether I trade for the reversal or not will depend ultimately on the larger sequence that I'm tracking. Um, and you can see here, I, I do believe we have a potential triangle unfolding in dollar yen as well. So what is my guidance for trading um, the reversal? Well, this, this is, I don't have a, a real market example off the top of my head to show you. So you're gonna have to trust me that this is typically what you're gonna see, uh, but you're gonna get that five wave move once the triangle's complete, okay? Um, and I can label this, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So a good way to trade the reversal would be to short the market on a break of the wave four extreme. Why is that? It's because uh, prices will typically travel to the fourth wave of one lesser degree, most often near the terminus of that fourth wave. Uh, so what that means is that we're now using a target of one further degree, uh, which would be down here. So this avoids picking a top in the market and allows you to look for uh, a reasonable trade. Now in this particular specific example, let's assume this is exactly what happens. I probably wouldn't use this method because the risk reward profile is simply not good enough. Um, now I rarely trade reversals once an impulse is complete, unless it's, it, that impulse is completing a larger corrective structure like we are in dollar yen. The only other time I would trade a reversal is when wave five does not take the shape of an impulse wave, but rather of an ending diagonal. Okay, so in an example like this, and that's a webinar for a different time, uh, you know, this is something that I would consider shorting because ending diagonals portend a very furious reversal and they have a very clear um, means of trading them as well.
All right, I don't see any other questions. Um, now this is, you know, I say this with all the webinars we do. If you've attended this webinar, it's an invitation to an ongoing conversation. So if you have questions about anything that we've covered today, just bring them up in the Parallax Discord. More than happy to go over all of this with you guys. Uh, yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure, man, my pleasure. All right, guys, I'm gonna end it here and uh, talk to all of you soon.